So ran into an issue on Steve's car. There's actually quite a few little little issues that's turned into a big issue. Uh, so I'm going to run you through that. Uh, he did not sound too pleased on the phone when I talked to him last night, but I mean, there's really nothing I can do about it. This is pretty much what happens when you, you know, get going on a car pretty good and then you add parts on later. But the parts we added on, you know, are pretty much necessity parts. So they, they kind of need to be on the car. Now, I, I want to make this clear. Steve is going to drive this car. He's actually going to drive it. This is not going to be one of them deals where you have your car restored and it just sits in the garage and you just go out every once in a while and wash it and drive it to car shows. This is a car he's actually going to drive and use it like it's supposed to be used for. He's going to drive it to work and he's going to do all that kind of stuff. So kudos for that. I'm with him 100% on that. But one of the things about driving them all the time is if you drive it somewhere and you run into rain, you've got to have wipers. You know what I mean? <laughs> for years, I ran rain X on the windshields on these cars. But uh, anyway, it, it's better to have wipers. So in that account, when the previous shop worked on Steve's car, they welded up the firewall and smoothed everything. So there's no hole in the middle of the firewall with the two nuts that are in there or anything for the factory uh, wiper motor. So what he ended up buying was the rain gear wiper system. Now there's a ton of videos on YouTube on rain gear, so I'm probably not going to do a full-blown video on that. There's a lot of videos on there. Uh, there's also one from Tri5 Guy, who I highly recommend his channel. He's got a lot of good uh, technical info at his channel. But uh, I think he's doing it on a 57 Chevy. 55 and 56 is probably just a little bit different. I don't know exactly how much different, but it is different. So this rain gear wiper system that Steve bought is everybody loves these things. These things are great. The thing about it is you can have a smooth firewall and you mounts behind the dash and you don't have all that crap out on the firewall. The factory wiper systems in these cars took cables. So it's very problematic if you don't have it set up right and greased and cleaned. It, it just you have all kinds of issues. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that is pretty common on an old wore out 55 or 6 when you get it up and running is you have your wiper arms on your car and your blades and stuff and you'll be going down the highway and a semi will pass you going the other way and the wind off of that, the force off that semi usually hits your wipers and knocks them about halfway up on your windshield and they just stay there. So what it is is you have slack in your cables. So, you know, when the wipers are used in that old 55 and 6 cable system, they get stretched out a little. Anyway, Steve got a rain gear wiper system for this car, and I think it has delay on it because the the switch knob says delay on it. So that is really nice just having a delay because these cars didn't have delay even when they had electric wipers. You could get vacuum and you could get electric. So I think the delay is a, a great, great upgrade for an old car like this. Now, it comes with this big giant switch that goes in the dash right here. It's where your factory wiper switch goes. So this will go in here to go through. And this big old box is on the back side. And it has these wires that I'm going to have to wire up separately. I kind of don't understand if it's a fit, you know, factory fit for the car, why that doesn't have a connector on the end of it, like a big plastic connector where you don't have to go and wire each one of these separately. But, I mean, not a big deal. But I do think this box is a little bulky for that. That's a big old box, you know what I mean? Now, here's the other problem that I'm having. So that goes into the dash behind here. This switch right here is for the electronic gas door thing that was put on the car. This makes the gas door open up the tail light. It no longer has the gas filler in the quarter anymore. So I mounted this here. So let's see if you can see it on the back. I'll put, move some of the stuff out of the way so you can put my hand back here so maybe you can see. That is the switch on the back side. It has all these wires sticking up there and these, you know, uncovered connections back there that could short out. This is interfering with that. So what I've got to do is relocate this over here, which is fine because that wiring harness that is on that is long enough to move it over here. So I'm just going to do that and that will eliminate that problem. However, the biggest problem is when you put the main rain gear system in here, this thing is like a foot long and it goes on up in here. And there's a bracket right here that I have to bend 30 degrees and use an existing hole in the firewall. So there's a little brace, a little rod brace like this one 
that goes right here. That is a support for your dash, for your dash not to move. They want you to remove that one and leave it out. So only only support brace you're going to have is this one. But anyway, that thing hangs way down there. And the motor is actually, you can't really see it, it's on the back side of it. So it says in the instructions you may have to move your factory uh, fuse box. This is what a factory fuse box looks like. That little bitty dinky thing. So imagine that you have to move this compared to that. Now this is just hanging here. I did not have that mounted like that. I actually had it upright like it's supposed to be, but up in there, right in the way of that. So when this came in a few weeks ago, I come out here and tried to set that up in there, and I actually unbolted the fuse box bracket and moved it over and down and kind of bent on the bracket a little bit to adjust it, and I was like, yeah, I think I can make that work. Well, you can't. After this is tightened up, it still hits the fuse box, but the worst part is, is you wouldn't be able to get to it to change the fuses because that motor thing's right in the way. So that fuse box has to be relocated, so I have to go that way with it. So the problem I have is this is a universal easy wire 12 circuit harness. My favorite bar none. So these 12 circuit easy wire harnesses are universal, meaning they go just about in any old car that you, you have. It's like for street rods and stuff. This is way different than a plug and play like from American Auto Wire, it's a direct fit. And what I mean is, when you buy the five, six, seven hundred, whatever dollars it is for the American Auto Wire kit that actually goes right in here and everything just plugs right in with connectors and it's, you know, plug and play, this one is not like that. This doesn't have connectors on the end of it. You have to hand wire everything separately. So there's a little more involved on wiring than it would be for the factory style plug and play. But when you upgrade things and change things like to HEI ignition and, uh, uh, alternator instead of generator to me this is the way to go because I don't mind putting connectors on the ends and plugging stuff in so also the other thing about these is the price now they offer these in a 12 circuit and a 24 circuit not a sponsor I've run a bunch of easy wires I have never had a problem with easy wire harnesses they've always performed flawlessly for me also the tech department if you ever have to call them they used to pick up the phone immediately and talk to you <laughs> Uh, I don't know how it is now because I haven't talked to him in probably at least a decade. But anyway, I love the kit. Now, if you're just doing a basic 55, 56, 57 Chevy, the 12 circuit is just fine. But if you're adding power windows and cruise control, you know, all kinds of add-ons and goodies, you probably need to get the 24 circuit because it'll have all them extra circuits for lots of other things. But Steve's car is pretty basic. However... You know, he's adding on a few other things that, you know, it, it's probably going to be getting about to the limit on this thing, but I still think we're going to be fine. So this is a cut to fit harness, meaning you mount that fuse box somewhere in the car and then you route the wires to wherever you need them to go and then you cut them to fit, put the connectors on and plug them in. So if you ever have to move that and it's cut to fit already, nothing's going to go in place like I have now. So the fuse box has to be relocated and the wires ain't long enough to do it. So the wire harness for the ignition switch is too short now. Also the column switch wiring is too short. So I just kind of run into some issues. Now also the previous shop when they tore his car apart, they unplugged a lot of it, but there is a few things that's been cut. So I'll have to go back in and fix that. But Back then, I had wired in some extra wires for stuff, and I don't remember what they were for. So <laughs> I need to pretty much pull the harness all down at least and cut some tape off of some stuff and, you know, check things out, trace wires and all that kind of stuff. But I would have to extend the wires for the ignition switch and the column, and I don't really want to do that. You know, I don't want to extend any wire, especially on an ignition switch. So... I called Steve last night. I, I told him it would probably be better to go ahead and buy another wiring harness, and I'll just change it out. Now, in the long run, this is better anyway, because back when I installed this 15, 16, 17 years ago, however long ago it was, I do it differently than what I did then. Back then, I just used old school crimpers and the, these old school style connectors, and you just smash them on there. Now I have these American Auto Wire 
stripper or crimpers. I have both. I have it for the bigger ones and then I have for the basic ones. So, and I don't use plastic insulated connectors mostly. I do every once in a while, but on a lot of the stuff, it'll get just a non-insulated with heat shrink. So it'll be a lot cleaner, but Regardless, this needs to be relocated and basically in a spot that is easier to get to. But anyway, if I have to cut fit wires, buying a whole new kit's the way to go. And also we're adding front speakers. So I had to dig these out of, these were all kind of put together and taped up in, a, in the harness. I went through and split the tape and pulled these out for the front speakers. Cause before we just had six by nines in the back. Another issue we have is the wiring harness for the tail light harness runs to the back of the car right here now there's the biggest problem is the electric gas door stuff because the gas field is supposed to be right here and now it's behind the tail light and it has this big wad of mess right here that harness is just about as big as the tail light harness itself on the car so that doubled it up in size diameter right there then i have some pretty large speaker wires two sets of speaker wires going to the six by nines so when you put this all the way down on the channel it's sticking up a little bit and i'm afraid when the seal covers go on here the the screw covers i think it's going to rub on that and might chafe over time so i need to thin this out so what i'm going to do is run the speaker wire separately on that side of the car and i think just those two will be enough to get it over there but i already had one harness put together for the tail and then i added on tape bundled wire for that so when i strip the tail light harness out of here i can kind of put everything together a little bit tighter but I'm gonna run the speaker wire separately down that side of the car that's the way I did my car it's a little bit more clean that way but anyway I'm also missing I'm not sure what they're cover called I always called them sill covers it's not the chrome or aluminum or stainless little trim plates that go on here to go over your carpet with the body by Fisher tag this is actually a cover a metal plate that screws onto the floor full length right here that's actually one of the holes for it right there but there will be more on the floor i may have to drill new ones but i don't have these for the car and uh, i'm not 100 percent, but i think they're the same for that's hard top and convertible only i think i'll have to look in a catalog but i need those seal covers because they serve two two functions they they cover the wires they you know put covering over the wire but they also level everything out out this way so your carpet doesn't sink in like that so there's supposed to be a wide metal plate that goes full length of that and screws on more inside right here then when you put your carpet down you put your sort door seal plates on here so i need those i do not have any extras of those if i had a set i'd give them to him but i think i had to buy new ones for mine if i remember i don't remember but they may be hard top only. I don't know if two-door sedan would be the same or not. And you know what? I don't even know if this two-door sedan even has any. Yeah, it's got part of one. This one's rusted away. I don't know if they're the same as hard top or not. I, I, I don't know. But anyway, this is what they look like when they're on the car, but the whole end is gone off this end, and then this end's partially rusted away. <clears throat> anyway, I need those for the car, and I, I, they are reproduced, I believe, but I'm not sure if they're hard top only. But anyway, so I'm going to rewire everything, and when I rewire it this time, it'll be a lot cleaner. And I'm going to talk to Steve and see what he wants to do. Um, we have the option to hide the wiring up here so it's not laying across the inner fender. I just kind of want to see what he wants to do. Um, but we could always do that. And there's another thing about it, and it's been so long since I put an easy wire kit in, I don't really remember all the specifics, but I'll know when the new kit comes in. It used to come with a larger wire, and I think it was if you were running a bigger alternator, you needed to upgrade to that wire, install that wire, and it's not on his car. Now, Here's something that some people may not realize, like particularly on a, like let's say a 55 Chevy, they came with generators, which are like, I don't even know what amps those things were, 20 amps or 25 amps or something. Don't quote me on that number, but it's a very low amp is what a factory generator supplies. And that's why if you ever drove these cars that was mostly original, when you pulled up to a stoplight or a stop sign at night, you would notice your headlights get dim. And then once you hit the gas, they'd brighten back up. 
And that is also why back in the day, when you had to get a jump start, people had to rev their car up to put more juice out to get in there. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to rev up your new cars. <laughs> so if you go to jump start with a new car, an old car, you don't need to rev your engine up to get more juice out there. It's already putting that juice out. So just in case you needed to know that. But Steve's alternator is just a little SI-10. So that is a that is an alternator, not a generator. So that is an upgrade from a generator right there going to alternator. But when you go to adding a bunch of accessories that take electric on your car, like electric fan, even an amplifier for a car stereo, you're going to need a little bit bigger of an alternator to charge all, you know, to carry all that load. So keep that in mind. So if he goes with air conditioning and we put on an electric fan and a fan probe and all that kind of stuff, it would probably be a good idea to go ahead and upgrade to an SI-12, at least alternator. That's what I have on mine as a 12. So anyway, just throwing stuff out there for a little bit more little tidbit information for you guys. So anyway, just kind of run into some issues with the wiring harness being too short now because it was cut to fit for the car when it was put together before as a basic 55 with a stock steering column and just a triple gauge set screwed under the dash. Now we have the instrument cluster in the dash, you know, all the cluster together, the classic instruments kit. So anyway, electric speedometer, there's quite a bit of changes that I have to do to this wiring uh, to, to fix it, to make it work. So that's why I think it'd be better just to put a new one in because right now none of the fronts wired up, like the headlights and stuff, all that stuff's hanging here. Now's the time to do it. So. It'll just be better. It'll end up in the long run being a better deal. So anyway, that's where we're at on that. But uh, anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about some easy wire harness add-on ideas that I do to save money. So I'll do separate little videos on that. Okay, so when I put a 12 circuit easy wire or even a 24 circuit easy wire universal harness in, and I have to put my own pigtails on everything to plug in, I change the headlight switch, the ignition switch, and the dimmer switch in the floor out to later model stuff from later model cars. I don't mess with that old 55 stuff anymore. And here's why. The very first 55 that I wired up with a new wiring harness, I wired it all up and it was easy wire, my first easy wire kit I put on. I had all kinds of wiring issues. It turned into like two weeks of headaches and I had problem after problem after problem. And the problem that caused all of it was because I didn't have the money to buy a new headlight switch, a new ignition switch, and a new dimmer switch. So all that stuff that had been sitting on that car since 1972 or whenever the last time it was driven, all that stuff was old and jacked up and corroded. So I was having issues. It wasn't just one, it was the other stuff as well. But anyway, so I decided to change it out. So this is some of the stuff that I do to change out. And for me, you can go to the local parts stores and this stuff will be in stock. And like a 55 Chevy headlight switch, they'll have to order it, no doubt. And it'll be a lot more money. The headlight switch is for a replacement for a 55. I wanna say they're around, I haven't priced one in a long time, guys, but I, I wanna say it's probably 50, 60 bucks, maybe. Maybe more, I don't know. These aftermarket ones I'm talking about are like $12 at O'Reilly's. So. This is kind of the way I do it, but for me, it has to be cheaper. I don't mind doing extra work to make it fit, but it has to be cheaper. And, you know, that way, if the part fails, it's cheap for me to replace. So here is the dimmer switch. This is one of the three components that I always change out on my easy wire harness changes. So this is the floor dimmer switch. This is what goes from low beam to high beam. And... Your factory original dimmer switch in the floor is this design right here. So it takes three spade connectors. You see how corroded those are? The main reason that these get so corroded is because they're outside the car. This goes through the floor from the outside up inside and then you put the screws on on the inside. So it hangs out down here. And I can tell right now by looking at Steve's, these connections are already corroded again. So when I wired his car, we used his original and I cleaned the connections up and put some dielectric grease on there. And of course now it's 
pretty bad looking. So I would pull these back off, clean these connections again, put more dielectric grease on there. So anyway, that that is what a factory one does. You have to replace it from outside in. So your wires are out here, something you see out here. Now, when you change to the later style, that wiring, it goes on the inside of the car. So your wires will actually run on top of the floor down here. And I wanna say they changed that in the later 50s on the GM cars. I don't really remember for sure what year. But anyway, that is this design right here. So what I do is I go into the parts store and I say I need a dimmer switch for a 72 Chevy pickup. It'd be the same for a 73. So, you know, square body to the C10 style, you know. But anyway, it's the same three-prong plug-in and it takes the same pretty much setup right there. Like you could pull them spades off and put on there if you wanted to. Now, to change these out, to put, make this go on the inside of the car so you don't get corroded wires on the outside, there's a little bit more to it than just bolting it on there. If you remove that out of your car, you're going to have a hole in the floor for this big thing right here. So what I used to do is I'd take a piece of rectangle sheet metal like this and I would put that on there and I'd trace out the mounting holes and I'd drill the holes in it. And then, of course, paint it. Don't leave it raw metal. And then I would take seam sealer and I'd slime it on, around it on the, on the back side. And then I'd stick it on on the inside and smush it. And then I would bolt that on and put nuts on the other side and I'd tighten it down and it'll smush that seam sealer out around it. And then you can just go around it with your finger and clean it off. But that will seal it to the floor and you can run this newer style with your wires on the inside if you wanted to. I would imagine that these are probably cheaper than the factory style if I had to guess. But this one actually, no, oh, it's there it goes. It's a little sticky, but anyway, I'm not going to use that. But that's factory 55 stuff, and I changed it out to this. Now that covers the dimmer switch. Well, this is just something I got off eBay. That's the part number right there, and I want to say this thing was like nine dollars or something. It was really, really inexpensive. And then this one here I bought for my wife's 55 four door last year. This is Ron Francis's setup, and it's probably the exact same dimmer switch. Uh, probably made by the same company, I would imagine, but just different branded packaging. Uh, but anyway, this Ron Francis kit, which is DS-03, it actually comes with the plastic wiring connector and the crimp-on connectors to go on that. So that when you crimp this onto your wiring, it would actually plug in with a plastic connector and come off in one unit instead of having to put three spades on. So I got that for my wife. That's what I'm gonna use on her car. Now I'll talk about headlight switches. So here's the headlight switch set up. This is a replacement 55 headlight switch right here. Actually, Terry brought me this. My subscriber friend Terry brought me this and this was new in the box, but this is for a 55. And I don't like these because for one, they're really expensive to replace. And the, the other thing is that little bitty fuse right there. If that fuse blows, you don't have any instrument lights, like your dash lights go out. My first 55, my dash lights didn't work. And I messed with it and messed with it and messed with it. And finally, an old mechanic told me, he goes, I think they have uh, fuses in them. And I'm like, what? No way. And I climbed under there and sure enough, there's that little bitty dinky fuse. And I went to like three parts stores before I finally found it because nobody had a little glass fuse that short. So I just don't like these. They're overpriced plus they have a fuse in them. Now what I changed to is this style, but this is definitely not something you just put it in the dash and, and go. There's a little bit more to it than that. This headlight switch is like the same as a 72 Chevy pickup, I think. And I think that's what I tell them at the parts store, 72 Chevy truck. But this is most definitely the same on square bodies and G bodies, because I always had a several of these laying around for my G body projects. That's the same headlight switch. Now, when you go to the parts store and you buy one of these, like say you went down there and said you wanted a headlight switch for a 1980 Monte Carlo, uh, this is what they're gonna give you in the box. That's all you're gonna get. If you're going to retrofit it in an old car, you need the nut that goes in here, and you also need the shaft that your knob goes on. So if you don't already have an old headlight switch with that stuff in it, you're not going to have that to put in your dash. The 
nut that screws this to the dash is not the same as a factory 55 when it won't fit that. So you have to have that nut, you have to have the rod. And your factory 55, 56 rod will not go in this headlight switch. This is round with one flat side on it. This is triangle shaped. So I think you can see right there, that's triangle shaped in there. So you have to have those two components for this newer style headlight switch. But if you go to the parts store to get a headlight switch for that car now, it's 12 bucks. So what I did for my wife's car is I bought this kit right here. This is the part number, it's American Auto Wire kit, 500-341. Now this comes with everything to retrofit it to an old car. It comes with the mounting nut, it comes with the rod, it comes with a billet knob that takes an Allen set screw. It comes with their, their crimp connectors, which I love since I have their, their pliers, their crimpers. And then you have the plastic connector that those snap into. So when you go to change a headlight switch, you just pull the whole plug-in off. Normally, I just wire these all separately with little insulated spades. So anyway, for my wife's car, I wanted to do a plug-and-play setup, so I bought all this stuff like a year ago. But if you had an old square body or G body or even an old Caprice or, you know, LeSabre, anything that has a headlight switch, you can go rob the headlight switch out of it. You have the nut already and you have the, the rod, which when they're used, this is what they're going to look like. It's going to be a black, and it could be aluminum, I don't know, but this is black coated. And then you have your triangle shaped rod there. Now to get that out of there, there's a little button right there with a spring under it. You push that down. You pull your headlights to where they're on position, like you're turning your headlights on. You pull that all the way out, and then you push down on that, and then that will pull right out of there. But to reinstall it, you just push it in there and push it all the way until it stops. You don't have to push the button again. But to remove it, you have to push this button with a spring down. So anyway what I normally do is I reuse my factory 55 knob which is this for a like a 210 um, now what I do is I crimp a pair of pliers on or uh, vice grips on here and I'll take my torch my map gas little propane handheld torch and I'll heat the crap out of that rod and that heat will transfer down here to this plastic knob don't heat it up here because it'll melt the plastic I like to get it down here till it gets it so hot that it transfers down that rod and then this will start smoking then you can pull that knob off there because these are a bear to get off there. But once those are off, you can actually put it on this triangle shaped rod for the later style headlight switch. I always cut these down a little bit because if you just put it on where the rod is, your headlight knob kind of hangs off the dash a little bit. So you definitely need to turn your headlights off and then put a mark and then figure out the depth of that and then go from there. But I use JB Weld, JB Quick, Panel Bond, or a two part epoxy to put that knob back on there and it'll stay. So anyway, that is the headlight switch that I always change out when I'm using a universal style harness that's not the plug and play. Now I wanna talk about ignition switches. Now this is a factory ignition switch right here for 55, um, the inner parts out of it. These, I didn't have a good, uh, experience with the very first reproduction I bought. It lasted me like a month and then the key you'd turn it and nothing had happened. Like I wasn't getting power, I wasn't getting anything. And I noticed that the center was real sloppy in it. So if you wiggled and jiggled it around you could get it to work. But anyway I ended up buying another new one and it, it was okay but I ended up selling the car so I didn't have it very long after that. But I don't have a lot of faith in these reproduction ones. Uh, but anyway the original and the reproductions they have spade connectors. They take spades. So if you're adding on extra wiring stuff to your car and you want to go off the ignition switch, like to the ignition wire, uh, definitely you want to fuse it. If you're going to do that, put an inline fuse on it. You can't really do that with all them spades. You'd have to go off the box, which there's nothing wrong with that. This is what I changed to. Now, this is the first time me using a Jegs. This one I actually got for my wife's car because I found this by accident at Jegs, and I want to say it was cheaper than O'Reilly's. I think this was like $15 or something, maybe even $10. This is identical to the Borg Warner CS7, Cat Sam 7. So this is a universal 12-volt ignition switch, and it comes with an aluminum knurled nut that you can put on there. 
And I usually polish that up on the buffing wheel. That one actually looks really polished already, but it comes with two keys. It takes nuts. So you can put ring terminals on your wires, and if you wanted to add ignition or battery wires, you could add them on there and just take the nut off, add another wire with a ring terminal on it, put the nut back on it. So these are my favorite. However, the hole in the dash is bigger than that. So trying to put this in there, uh, you usually have to put, I usually put a giant star washer behind it, like go to the hardware store and you can get a giant star washer, it'll fit on this. And I put the star washer on it and then put it in from the backside coming out of the dash right here. So it'll come out this way. And what that does is it keeps the whole switch from turning in the dash because the hole's smaller. There's other mods you can do. Uh, my wife's car, I actually did some welding on it and modified it so when the switch goes in, it stays in place. But, uh, you know, if you're working with an already painted dash, uh, you can do that with the big star washer. Um, anyway, this is my preferred ignition switch. It's mainly because of the price and you can stack ring terminals. But that is a... The Borg Warner and this is the identical switch. Like the same company's making that switch. It's just in a Jigs package. And this was, I want to say it's like 10 bucks or something. But I bought this last year, so I'm sure it's more now. But these are my favorite ignition switches. I have it in my hard top. I'm going to have it in my wife's 55. It's in Steve's car. So that is just, to me, the way to go. But uh, anyway, there is a way to get around spend a lot of money doing this stuff but you do have to modify a few of the things to make them work but for me it's about saving money and parts availability at the parts store so i have an existing video on my channel and i will link it at the end of this video so if you're in my shape like what i was talking about you buy an american auto wire plug and play kit it already has these connectors on here for your factory instrument cluster so if you buy a universal kit, they don't come with these funky connectors for this. But I have a solution for that, and I'll link that video after this one. It's a really short video. It's like five minutes long. So anyway, that's how I do my wiring. Thanks for watching.